announce it now, but uh, one thing that, that uh, it was an interesting title by Amy Webb, who we saw two weeks ago on video. She's a futurist. She talked about the signals are talking. So she's talking about the future and, and seeing what's going on. Here we're doing the opposite. We're, we're taking the talking and extracting signals out of it. And, and, and the company that Ali works for does precisely that. So uh, computers and speech goes back a bit. A lot of you had personal exposure in the 80s to, for example, to, to get account balances and so on with push button telephone. And before the 80s, it was pretty crude. It was uh, recorded um, tapes that were spinning around, and they would read back the digits. And then uh, at MIT, there was a, a fellow, uh, Dennis Kratt, a professor, that worked on a, a vocal track model. And that eventually became adapted to, a, 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 to Deck Talk, which is a company that, that, that was, used to be very strong around here. And he probably called up on the phone since the 80s and, and he heard the perfect Paul voice. He's sort of a Nordic voice, where he gave the account balances and, and what have you. So that, that's all text-to-speech, and then we saw that fairly easily. Back in the day, though, the, the other part of it, it's a little bit harder, is going from our, our speech to text. And uh, there were some local companies like Dragon, Dragon Dictate. Peter just came in. I think he worked at those companies and knows, knows well what was going on back then, and then eventually Nuance. And then now it's pretty pervasive, right? With, with, you can talk to Google or, or Siri or Amazon. So today we're going to be talking about a, another dimension, sort of the, uh, the sentiment analysis of, of that speech. Whether the, when, you, when you're talking to the computer, whether you're uh, angry at it, you're happy, confused. And, 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 and the reason that they're doing this is, is to uh, so that somebody on the other side of the planet that's answering the, the, the call center on a noisy line who may not have English as their first language can help you out and, 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 and be successful for that call. And that's what Cogito is, uh, uh, does. Now, Ali has been um, working in the industry 30 plus years. He did his PhD dissertation uh, at the MIT Media Lab and, and that, in the area of, of vision and 3D vision. And he actually started a company, Alchemy 3D Technology, back then, uh, which uh, worked in, in the uh, video post-production industry, in camera and, and, and uh, moving objects. And then it, after that, he, he, did, uh, he was on the research staff, that, uh, or consulted to Michi Michi Electric Research Labs. And then uh, about a dozen years ago, he co-founded Cogito, the company that we're going to be talking about today with a partner, he's been CTO since, uh, for the last 10 years anyway. So I'd like to uh, introduce Ali, and we look forward to your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, in talking to Steve and, and others, I think a, a lot of you want to talk about some of the underlying technology. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is start out with uh, with a presentation about our company, what we do, uh, why it's important and, and kind of amazing, and then, uh, and, then, and then we can have just sort of a, a, a more informal uh, discussion that can go any way that, that you want to about AI or, or speech or, or things like that. Uh, does that sound good? Sure. All right. All right. So, um, all of you have called a call center for, uh, for some reason or another at some point in your life. You probably heard a couple things on there which are very relevant to our business. Uh, the first is that your call is very important to us. Uh, the second, that this call may be recorded for quality and training. And both of these things are, are very true. Now, you know, despite the fact that you've probably had pretty poor uh, experiences calling a call center, uh, it is actually true that your call is really important to these companies, especially large companies and commodity businesses like finance, insurance, and even retail, where their their products are not very uh, are not very differentiated. You know, one bank account is pretty much the same as another bank account, and so there's not a lot of price differentiation. There's not a lot of, of value differentiation in their products, and their their relationship with you is the most important thing for them to grow and maintain their business. And the eyes, ears, and mouth of the company are the, the thousands, tens of thousands of agents. You know, most of our customers are companies that have call centers that have 
uh, agents in the tens of thousands um, on the phone every day. And so that, that personal connection to you is, is really, it's really important, but how do, you, how do you deal with the problem of getting 10,000 uh, individual people, uh, you know, most of which are, you know, are people with sort of high school equivalent uh, education, uh, uh, giving the best experience to, to customers to represent the company in the best way. Well, one way that they do it is they record the calls and they have a quality assurance function. So, the you know, however, you know, even today, uh, you know, before Cogito and uh, the, you know the best ideas that that they've had about how to do this is you record the calls. You have a, a separate quality function, and what they typically do is they typically will randomly select two or three phone calls uh, per agent per month, and they'll, they'll listen to the, the phone calls and, uh, from the recording, and they have a checklist of all the things that they want you to do, and they basically uh, make a list of all the things you did wrong. And then your, and then your supervisor uh, is intended to have a, a meeting you know, with each agent, so sort of once a month, and they'll go over those two or three calls and all the things you did wrong, and you can imagine that this is not a, a very effective way of getting quality out of calls. And it also sort of creates an adversarial relationship between the, the agents and the company. And it's not necessarily achieving the goal. But without technology to support them, there, there really are, are not a lot of better tools than this sort of thing. So um, there, there's a better way. And, and this is what, uh, what we call augmented intelligence. And so this is a little bit different than um, what a lot of people, you know, call artificial intelligence, with a goal of trying to replace uh, replace humans in a task. Augmented intelligence is the idea of being able to help and coach people to perform some kind of function better. And so it has sort of three components. Uh, you need it needs to be human aware. So it has to be aware of what's going on. It has to be uh, uh, human empowering. So it's actually helping someone, not replacing them. And in order to, to do this in, in this function anyway, it has to be, all that has to take place in the moment. Because you have to help someone uh, while they're on the phone. And so from a technology standpoint, there's, there's three components. The sensing uh, of, of behavior, and, and that is you know, for us, capturing telephone conversations in real time and, 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 and getting those signals. Um, understanding uh, what's going on in the conversation so that you can figure out what to do to help someone and then actually having an impact by uh, providing feedback to the user. Uh, so th this middle part is where, the, is where the machine learning comes in. So. Uh, this results in, uh, you know, for us, our system. So our system, uh, the center of it is the core technology is called Behavioral Signals Platform. It can take in behavioral signals in real time, apply models and, uh, and, and, and logic to that to understand uh, what's going on and what it can do to help, and then yeah, provide, provide feedback signals and events back to a user and help them uh, help them do better. Does it also have information on the individual who's receiving the call, things that individual did in the past? Uh, in principle, yes. So it, it certainly knows who the agent is. Uh, at this point in our company, we haven't done a lot of integration with the customer uh, information system. No, no, I so meant from the, the agent. Yeah, so it does. And there, there are a couple of things that we do in our technology that are specific to uh, a particular person. So for example, one of the things that our product does is they'll, they'll notify an agent if they're talking too fast. Uh, but because people have sort of natural, um, you, you know, so their, their own natural speaking rates, the, what we do is we actually, we actually build an mo uh, individualized model of someone's personal behavior, and then, and then we actually uh, can parameterize the model with respect to that, so that we can, uh, so that we don't get as many false positives for that particular person. 
Um, so the kinds of things that our technology does is, uh, is, not, uh, is not look at what is being said. Although we, we do do that, we're starting to incorporate words, uh, speech to text in our processing. Uh, mostly what we're doing is uh, understanding the behavior of the conversation. So to get sort of a feel for what, the, what our technology does is imagine yourself listening to a conversation in a, in a foreign language that you don't understand. You can t still tell a lot about what's going on in the conversation, right? You can tell whether, whether the, the people talking are in agreement or disagreement. You can tell whether, they're, whether someone's angry, whether someone's dominating the conversation. And, um, and those are the kinds of things that, that, we're, that we're listening for, and uh, primarily. And so the, uh, you know, it's, not all, it's not what you say, but how you say it is the... Uh, is, is sort of the, the mantra here is that uh, it turns out that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of meaning conveyed in the behavior of a conversation, and so the you know the the, the theoretical background here uh, is in evolutionary biology. You know, language is actually a fairly recent uh, is fairly a, a recent capability. You know, on an evolutionary scale, uh, before language. People and primates and, and, and other animals and other social animals communicate with each other fairly effectively without language, and you know that the part of your brain that that uh, that deals with that signaling and the, that social signaling uh, is, is a more primitive part of the brain, and, it, and it's it's still part of your brain today, and it's overlaid with 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 layers that uh, that can do things like language. So it, it's really a fundamental. A fundamental aspect of, of human uh, human social behavior that we can communicate a lot through our behavior. That that's what our technology is doing. So what our product is is uh, you know this is a depiction of an agent desktop. They'll usually have some kind of a CRM up, and and we have a we have a small interface that that sits on the side, and as the agent is is talking in a conversation, if we identify something that uh, some conversational aspect where we can we can help the agent uh, have a better conversation, then uh, then we can give them uh, a notification, and and that can help them uh, figure out what to do better. So the other thing that the technology does is it it uses uh, it uses machine learning to to develop uh, scoring models. For conversations, and these scoring models are designed to sort of evaluate what the customer experience was on the call, based on, primarily on behavior. And this is something that's mostly used uh, by supervisors and the organization to understand uh, what's going on in the call center and how to how to improve it. Um, and so those are the two things that it does. So again, we're we're sensing using telephony audio, understanding using these behavioral models, which are which are mostly trained using machine learning, and and then this system here, which uh, provides feedback back to the user and can help uh, impact the conversation. So, so does it work? Yes, it works very well. And the the question is why. Um, so, what happens when what happens when you help people have better conversations? Is it allows it allows the agent to develop a better rapport and better trust with who they're talking to, and that can have a lot of great effects. So, good conversations often turn out to be shorter conversations. So, uh, decrease so average call time is is a metric that almost all call centers use because you know time on the phone is money. Uh, so they're very happy when calls can be shorter. Um, now, not all call centers, a lot, a lot of call centers are moving away from this as a metric because they understand that sometimes call time is in opposition to call quality and actually solving problems. But, but every call center will happily take shorter calls because that's, uh, that's you know, their major cost is time on the phone. Um, so in this case, 14% decrease in average call time is, is a, huge, a huge improvement. And the reason that calls are shorter is because you have, a, you have better trust, you can develop better rapport, better trust in the conversation, and then you can, 
and then you, you can solve the issues together a, a lot quicker. Um, it also leads to uh, an increase in first, call, in first call issue resolution. So FCR, first call resolution, is another metric, performance metric, that a lot of call centers use, which is how often is the problem solved on the first call. Because if it's not solved on the first call, it means you're going to get another call. And that's going to be more cost, and it's going to be more uh, a, a poorer experience for the, the customer and, and, and everyone. So first call resolution uh, increased. Um, Another important thing that we particularly found in this, with this customer is that is an increase in employee engagement. <clears throat> Being on the phone eight hours a day is it's a very tough job. And you're generally, you're generally listening to uh, angry customers, or at least customers have a problem that need to be solved, and there's often a lot of stress. So it's actually it's a very stressful job. And, and a, you know, if you walk into a call center and, and look at a, at a call center agent's screen, they typically have like 10 to 20 different applications on their screen. Uh, many of these are interfaces to databases and tools and knowledge bases and things like that. But Cogito is the only tool that they have on their desktop that's actually designed to help them, help them do their job better and have, have better conversations. Um, and so when, when agents have that that tool and it's helping them, uh, helping them get through the day and have good conversations and consistent conversations throughout the day. Uh, that's something that they appreciate. It helps them be a little bit more engaged in what can become a really tedious job. And then um, the the fourth uh, fourth metric is uh, is an NPS measure called TNPS, which is which is transactional NPS. Uh, is, is everyone familiar with NPS, Net Promoter Score? So net promoter score is a is a is a, a sort of a customer engagement score that was developed by Bain some time ago. Almost everyone uses it this day uh, today. If you've ever gotten a questionnaire that asked you just one question, um, would you would you recommend this product to someone you know? That that's NPS. Um, what it's measuring is um, what it's measuring is so net promoter. So so. The, the net promoter scale goes from 0 to 10, and the, the low scores from like 0 to 6 are, are considered responses that would be a detractor. So someone who's not going to recommend or maybe will, will anti-recommend uh, a product or service to someone. And then the high scores, 9 and 10, represent promoters. And what the score is sort of the difference between your promoters and your detractors. So it's called a net promoter score. Um, and so it, it, it goes from minus 100 to 100. And you know, there's an awful lot of companies that we deal with that have negative uh, net promoter scores. Your, your, your cable companies almost all have net, uh, negative <coughs> net promoter scores because they all, they all live in local monopolies where they, they really, you know, although they would like to have great customer service, it just honestly is not a, it's not a business priority for them because, uh, because they have a local monopoly. You really, you know, they'll help you try solve your problem, but but they don't have competition, so it's not, uh, it, it just doesn't end up being a priority. Um, Apple, of course, is the classic, uh, you know, net promoter score. You know, they've got sort of probably the highest, the consistently highest net promoter score of any, of any company in the world. Uh, but transactional NPS is about this, about this transaction. So this is typically what's used in a call center. Uh, based on the conversation you had today, would you recommend uh, our product or our services or our company? Uh, to your, uh, to someone you know, um, and the, you know, the re results that we saw in this case case study, and, and with most of our customers, is that is that when we do a when we do a uh, control study of of agents that are using our product versus agents who are not using our product, we see a a, a significant increase in net promoter score, and we believe that comes from the ability of the system to help the agents have better conversations and. And build more trust and confidence in the company. Um, you know, it's not a unique case. We we now have, um, you know, our, our customers that I mentioned are some of the, the biggest companies, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies in the world. Um, these these are companies that have call centers with tens of thousands of agents and, and really, uh, you know, really big challenges in terms of 
of trying to, to build a consistently good uh, customer experience with their, with their customers. So, uh, so that's all I have uh, about, the, uh, about the company and the technology. And uh, so now you I'd like to... You mention the fact that most of these agents, this is my experience, yeah. are foreign-born. English is no better than their second best language. And uh, sometimes they have a lot of trouble understanding what they're being told. Yeah, so there, there has been a lot of outsourcing of call centers to uh, particularly to Asia, to India, uh, the Philippines. Um, th there's a lot of reversal of that these days. A lot of people, a lot of these companies that we do business are, are, bringing, are bringing their call centers back to the U.S. In fact, most of our, most of our customers, uh, most of the agents that, that our product is sitting in front of us are actually uh, agents who are based in the U.S., where English is their native language. Um, but but what, one notable thing um, that, that people sort of uh, agree on anecdotally is there, there, are, there are cultural differences. Um, and so, uh, for example, Filipinos can speak English very well, but culturally they have, they have different reactions. And so when, when Americans call uh, Filipino call centers, they, they re their, our reaction is that the, the, the agents sound very uncaring or, or unresponsive because that, that's, that's just the, the way that they interact is a little bit different. And it, 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 uh, it, it feels not as, uh, not as engaging as, as someone from our own country. Uh, sorry. Uh, about the technology, yeah. uh, there were three elements to it that you spoke about. The first one is the voice capture. Yeah. Do you capture words and then have an algorithm that looks at the words that are being used and forms some sort of context and then scores that? Do you look at the actual voice pattern and that, you know, whether it's tremble in the voice, you know, pitch variations and, and things like that, and do that kind of analysis? You know, just, just under, underlying that, what are the kind of metrics that you use in terms of analyzing the, the audio? Yeah, so it's the second one. Uh, we're only now beginning to get into words. And at this point, we feel that speech-to-text is kind of a, te a commodity technology. And so we're not building that ourselves. There is an argument that we could actually do some very interesting things ourselves in, in uh, speech-to-text because we have a unique context. And so, so we could use our unique data set of call center calls to actually do much better than sort of a uh, off-the-shelf uh, speech-to-text, large vocabulary speech-to-text. But, um, but definitely the latter. And the, the way that we do this is, um, uh, so it, it, it's, it's mainly machine learning. And so, uh, so there's, there's two things that we do, uh, as I mentioned. So one is the live guidance. And in, with the live guidance, um, the, the original technology that we built was, was mostly algorithmic. And we were looking for things, yes, like pitch variation. Uh, we were looking at, uh, at timing features. So I, I, I used to characterize them as sort of three types of features. One are vocal acoustic features, which is how you sound. So that's sort of the frequency profile, the, 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 the timbre or the tone of, of how you're speaking. So that's very short time slice stuff. Uh, then. The second category of features is sort of individual prosody. What's the rhythm of, what's the rhythm of your speech uh, as, as you're speaking? And that's sort of a longer time scale thing. And then uh, the third category was, uh, was conversational dynamics. So how is the conversation going back and forth between, uh, between two speakers? And, and so that's sort of the feature set. And then that all goes into, um, you know, into a system where we can pull various things out of it. So, so Following that, if I were to say in a very calm voice, I am about to kill your wife, yeah. you'd never pick up that as a danger sign, and you, you wouldn't re you, your software wouldn't be able to react to that yeah, in and, general. Yeah, and, and vice versa, too. Uh, if, you, if you just look at the transcript of a conversation, the transcript can be, uh, and, and you know, we talk to our customers about this, and, and uh, because there are, there are a lot of, 
companies who are doing uh, post-call sort of speech analytics based on converting the recordings to text and then and then trying to do sentiment analysis on that, the, which is basically the first thing that you described. Right. Um, and so the so so that's true too. If you if you look at the text, it can look like a perfectly great conversation, but if you actually listen to it, you would you would know that it's not. Like there's a huge pause in there. There's sarcasm, you know, things like that that you that you're not picking up in the in the words. So so, so the best ob the best thing obviously is to do both of those things. Yeah. And that's where we're going. All right. So so you're just gonna you you you. So what I understand you to say is basically the sentiment part, which is it's new in terms of uh, social media sentiment analysis, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. So that's the part that you're going to incorporate going forward in terms of your prospective uh, features? Yeah, I think just words in general. So there's a lot of things that we can do with words in our product. Uh, one of them, one of them is, is sentiment. Um, and but, but imagine being able to take the words now, and instead of just trying to use the words to get sentiment, you're combining that with the speech behavior. And so if you have words and behavior, we believe that that's, that's really the best thing, uh, and, and, and that's going to give you, the, you know, the, most, uh, the most accurate representation of what's going on. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. This sounds like uh, driving, having a police cruiser right behind you all the time. Uh, how do you uh, get the agents uh, past that uh, uh, concept? That's a really good observation, and um, the so I, you know, one of the challenges that we that we have in our company is how do you build a user interface for this sort of thing? And at the beginning, it seemed it seemed pretty straightforward. Oh, there's things going on. We'll just put it on the screen. It'll help them, and everyone will be happy. But actually, it's pretty hard. There's a couple of reasons why it's really hard to do these real-time UIs. One is that I, I, show, I showed you, I sort of described the call center agent screen, right? They've got, they've got a million things going on. So they're on the phone, and they've got visual overload as well. And somehow, we're supposed to have a box here that is, is going to be helpful to you. Uh, so it's going to be there when you need it, but it's going to kind of not be distracting you when you don't need it. Uh, so that's very challenging. And then the other challenging thing is how... How do, you, uh, how do you help someone without being a nag? And you know, a lot of the early feedback we got on, on, uh, on the product is that it, it feels like someone's just, just nagging you on things. Mm -hmm. Now, th there's, there's mixed reactions because some agents actually appreciate it. Uh, so they have a conversation with their supervisor, and their supervisor says, you know, you're always interrupting people. And, and they say, like, I don't think I interrupt people. Um, but then when they're notified in the moment as they're interrupting someone, they realize, oh, you're right, I, I, I am interrupting people. And so, so some, some agents appreciate it. Other, other feedback that we've gotten is it, is it, feels, like, uh, it, it feels like you're nagging me or, or like big brotherish that, you, that you're monitoring, like is, is, my, uh, you know, is my bonus going to depend on this? So w what happens in, in, in a lot of call centers, the way that... Um, the way that agents get motivated is that, you know, these quality reviews that I, that I just talked about, in some call centers, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, every month they'll, they'll either get a bonus or they won't get a bonus, or they'll get some level of bonus, and, and that depends on, on what their scoring is on those quality things. So they're already being watched. I mean, they know, like you do when you call, that their call is being recorded for quality and, and monitoring, right? So... So they, they know they're being watched, so that part is not, is not necessarily new to them, but maybe having it, having it visually there all the time may, may, feel, like, may f feel a little bit more onerous because you actually realize uh, what's going on. So you know, our challenge is to, is to make that user experience better so it feels helpful, so it feels like a coach that's helping you and not feel like a big, uh, big brother or someone who's sort of monitoring you. Um, I'm listening to this and I'm just wondering, you're talking about the conversation on both sides. So we already know that the customer calls already has a problem. So they're already triggered and they need answers. And on the other side, we have the employee who is dealing with them, who the system is designed to trigger them too. Because as you said, they have to perform and there's going to be a score and now there's going to be a reward. So are you, are you, and it's constant. 
And if the advisor, at, uh, if their supervisor comes to them and says, well, you did this, he said that very calmly. And then they answered very calmly. My guess is, in their brain, they're like, oh my god. <laughs> and if it happens over and over again, it's a trigger. So my question is, are you also watching the turnover of the employees as a measure? Well, completely independent of us, um, agent, agent turnover in call centers is on average 40% per year already. It's a very stressful job. That's on average. Some, some call centers are over 50%, 60-70% turnover. Uh, a call center, a call center is doing well if they have, you know, 30% turnover. Um, so are you monitoring so, the, that turnover once you introduce Cogito to them? Uh, that's a good question. I, I've recently thought that that is, that that is potentially a good value proposition that we can go after, which is um, if, if we can build a, a product, because again, this product is, is aimed at the agent as a user, and it's aimed at helping them. Um, and you know, we're not doing a bang up job of that yet, but our goal is to actually build agent engagement um, and, and help them get through their day. Um, you wouldn't believe um, the, you, you know, the, you know, what effect just some small joy during the day can be for these agents because they're on call after call after call. And, and you know, one of the things that we've talked about in our product is, is some gamification. And one of the things that we do with the, with the agent groups, you know, when we go in, you know, for training is we do what's called the Kojido Cup, which is like a challenge. And so the agents are involved in, in, in trying to, uh, you know, in trying to get their, what we call the CX score, which is the customer experience score, that, which is what, what we're scoring on every call. And, and so they, they sort of compete against each other. And just that game, just having that as part of their day, um, you know, to sort of take their minds a little bit off of what they're, what they're doing or, or have, have some sort of goal, uh, you know, amongst themselves is, is really something that they appreciate and, and, and they, they really love that sort of thing. Do you uh, congratulate them when they do a good job? Oh, yeah, we do. We give them trophies and, and, and all kinds of things. Yeah. No, but I think you meant real time, right? You know, you yeah. know at, oh, at yeah. the end of the call, good, you know, good, oh, oh, good that, job, you know, gold star yeah. pops up on the screen or something. Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the things that we've been working on recently, and we're actually, we're actually rolling out now, is a lot more positive, uh, positive reinforcement. So, so this has been a debate in the application design. So at the, at the very beginning, you know, we have behavioral scientists uh, in, our, in our company, and we understood from the start that um, that you want to you want to give positive feedback, or, and you and you want to give feedback in a positive way, not always negative. But in, in some of our initial deployments, um, what we what we have to balance that against is the distraction, right? And and during a call, so so one point of view that we got early on with some of our customers is um, is is just give feedback when it can be helpful. So, but that tends to be the feedback about something that you're doing wrong, not something that you're doing right. But as we get more experience, we've discovered that, you know what, the, uh, so our, our, uh, our head of product management, uh, you know, came, came back from call center and, you know, every time he goes to a call center uh, and, and sort of observes people using our product, when he says that their favorite thing is when they get that thumbs up, you know, doing a good job and that positive feedback. And uh, so, so we're trying to figure out ways where we can, where we can strike that balance of bringing in positive feedback without, uh, without being an extra distraction. You know, all of these things are part of our, uh, you know, trying, to, trying to build a user experience that's engaging and helpful. And, and that will be in 101. Yeah. <laughs> so for every positive thing or try to do a good thing, there's a negative side. So what happens, who's monitoring whether or not they accept your feedback and actually use it, or they don't, they ignore it? So the great thing about our, our product is that we're observing the behavior all the time. So 
what we can do is we can, we can observe behavior. We know when the notification went there, and we can continue to observe the behavior. So we can actually tell from our own data whether the notifications are having an effect, whether it's changing behavior. Uh, and then you know, the next step is whether it's changing behavior in a positive way. And then the next step is whether, whether that behavior change is af affecting the KPIs, the business KPIs uh, that our customers care about. Does that answer your question? Well, <clears throat> it is a tedious job, you can tell. Yeah. You know, I've been on the phone with some of these folks for even up to an hour yeah. trying to get a technical problem solved. So I, I appreciate some of these folks that are that speak slow enough so I can understand them rather than like a machine gun. Right. And uh, you know, their patience. A lot of them have a lot of patience. But there's a hmm. lot of negative stuff up there and fact stuff they've got to keep sorting out. Now you come in with a uh, helpful thing, and now the helpful thing could turn into a negative thing. Yeah. So yeah. they have to be conscious of following your screens as well. So that's yet another screen to follow. Yeah, and, and that, that's the challenge. It's, <clears throat> it's, it's challenging, you know, we're... You know, it's a big focus of ours is, is trying to figure out how to, uh, how to give feedback and provide an engaging experience that can actually uh, help, them, you know, help them through their day. There's, um, you know, by the end of the day, you know, some of these agents take 30, 40, 50 calls in a day, and, uh, and they experience something that's called compassion fatigue, is that they, they literally... You know, and, and this is experienced by, you know, people in the medical profession as well, you know, who are just dealing with, with horrible things all day, that you just, you, your brain literally gets blunted, and, and you, you lose your ability to have compassion. And so what the, what the software uh, it tries to help you do is just be aware of those things. And, and by being aware, at, at least you can behave in a way that, that helps you have better conversations. <clears throat> I have a question about uh, training. <clears throat> Just to give an example, I called up a bank. Mm -hmm. God bless them, they put a new system. Yeah. Well, it was two and a half weeks before I could look at my checkbook on my computer. Mm -hmm. So that, do you get enough data to indicate, to warn the corporate office, hey, that there's an area here that maybe needs training? You know, some of the... Oh, by the agents, you mean? Yeah. Of the agents? The company needs to train the agent or the, all their people if they're getting this same question, you know, how do I log on to something like that, how, oh, an IT type of thing, yeah. okay? But, I mean, hopefully they're training their agents on the product, you know, that they're working with. Yeah. That's number one. So I guess the question to reword it is, do you ever, does your database flag uh, training needs? Yeah, so I think there's, there's two, there's, there's two or three things in there. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that there's a lot of companies are doing post-call word analysis, mm -hmm. and, and that can be used to find topics. And so what those are being used is as business intelligence to figure out what are the topics being talked about in the call center. And so if there's something like there's some particular uh, bug in the product or if there's a particular IT problem that, that people are calling about, mm -hmm. uh, then, then, they can, uh, then they can really focus on that. Um, and, and, and we're going to try to do that too. Where, where, we, can, where we can add something significant to that mm -hmm. is we can, we can figure out why your call center is blowing up right now because we do, we do our analysis in real time as opposed to at the end of the day. So one of the things that we can do uh, eventually, and one, one direction our product is going in, is real-time call center intelligence on those topics. Um, the other thing, uh, oh, what was the other thing I was saying? Oh yeah, so, so in, terms of, um, in terms of understanding training of agents, mm -hmm. uh, our software already does that because what we, what we do is uh, we also have an interface with the supervisor and so the supervisor can see their whole team mm -hmm. and they can see their, uh, their score profile and uh, 
every supervisor, every supervisor knows who their top performing agents are and who their bottom performing agents are. Right, but for IT, that's difficult to do because my experience with the bank was never IT. But I'm just, I, I never asked them. I should have asked them because my son used to do oh, well, did that IT work. Anyway, make a long story that's short. I'm just curious if the bank I worked with all of a sudden realized they were getting thousands of calls. I don't know whether if they're national or not, but it was a pretty good sized bank. Yeah. <laughs> But, but, but here's an interesting use case that, uh, you know, that's, that's really something that we ran into, is early on in, our, early on in developing our technology, we were, you know, I told you we had features based on individual prosody, prosody uh, that include things like long, pause, long extended pauses mm -hmm. and things like that. And we got a data set where we found sort of an unusual number of sort of long pauses and and, and really awkward conversations, and I was wondering why. So I went, went in and listened to some of these calls, and I realized that the reason they have a lot of these long pauses is, is, is because of the IT, that, mm -hmm. that, that the agents were literally waiting for screens to come up. And so you have these just really terrible conversations because the, the caller is sitting there on the end of the line like, what's going on? Hello, are you still there? Um, because they, you know, because of the IT system. So you can actually, so, I have thought that one of, one of the value propositions that we can do when we come into a new company, you know, we're recording you know, ten, tens of thousands of, of calls per day, um, is that we can just profile the calls and say, here's, here's five things you can do uh, operationally, you know, by changing your operational procedures to improve the, the, um, improve the conversations. A another example of that is that, um, in, in a lot of type of phone calls, uh, agents have to agents have to say disclosures to you, mm -hmm. and so this is another place that trips up our our sort of normal because in normal conversation you don't have someone droning on for a minute, right? And that's an indication that something's wrong that you're not actually allowing room for someone else to speak, mm -hmm. and so, uh, but what we find you know we go in back and listen and say well they're giving a disclosure and it's required to give that disclosure. So I thought, like, operationally, some advice that we can give to our customers is, you know what, if you have to give this disclosure, um, it's another way to do it is get the agent off the phone right. and give that disclosure via, you know, recording, and then get acknowledgement of the disclosure from, from the user. So you don't have to, uh, so that doesn't have to be part of the conversation. Uh, things like that. Um, so, so I think there's a lot that we could potentially do in, in sort of optimizing the conversations and right. optimizing all the processes uh, in the call center to, you know, so that you can actually have a, so that the callers can actually have a better experience calling the companies. Yeah, because I'll tell you one other thing. Your product reminds me of a software package for a corporate coaching. And that means you get psychologists, scientists, and everybody talking how to make the workplace better. Yeah. Can but you talk a little louder? <clears throat> oh, what I'm talking about is this product reminds me of a, of Somebody I know who's in the corporate coaching business yeah. of training corporate CEOs all the way down how to handle their business from a humanistic point of view. Yeah. You know, getting the psychologists and the scientists, everybody together, and how to react and how to relate. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's that's how we describe our business now. We describe our business as an AI coach, and we, <laughs> you know, and, and we have a vision that professionals. Professionals in a lot of areas will have, uh, in the future, will have so-called AI coaches that will help them perform in their job better. Right. So, for example, in the call center right now, where we have been so far, really focused on helping agents do their agent job better. And we, we provide, uh, we also provide help to supervisors for supervising agents. But our next target is how, how can we help supervisors be better supervisors, exactly. better at their jobs, um, you know, because they have to do a lot of communication as well, and then and then managers and executives, how how can you help them? Yeah. Right. Sorry, a lot of. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I about this pushing the disclosures over to a recording. Mm -hmm. I what often happens with companies is when you tell them that, I dial up a company, and in this multi-level menu that I have to go through to get to an agent, mm -hmm. there are lengthy disclosures that are just shoved in there. Yeah. Nothing is more frustrating or more discouraging 
to a customer service call from the customer point of view than that. You mean before you get to an agent? Before you ever get to an agent, you have to wade through 10 minutes of disclosures. Yeah, they so tell you, your call is important. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go for the you yeah, That's before you even get into the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I, talk, I was talking more about things um, that happen wrapping up a call. So, like when when an insurance agent sends sells you something, yeah. or if uh, or if uh, or if someone uh, if you're on like a pharmacy benefits call and they're and they're recommending a drug and, and they have to they have to give the disclosure. Now, I, I realize that there may be. Uh, you know, I, we haven't looked into this deeply. You know, there may be, it may be that the reason that a human has to read it to you is that, is that you have to actually get acknowledgement from the caller that they actually understood and uh, the, the disclosure. <coughs> but um, but I, I still think there's opportunity there to, so to take that part out of the conversation. When it goes through yeah. a recording, that has a very negative impact on the customer yeah. experience. Yeah, those are things that we have to we have to figure out. Unfortunately, these are required, as you say. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yes. Could you tell us some more about the underlying technology? For example, is the voice analysis done on the uh, the agent's computer? Is it done on a central server? Are there any issues in telling uh, what who is speaking, whether it's the agent or the uh, the customer calling, for example? Okay. Good. Good. Good questions, uh, and those are really important at the actual implementation level. So on the second part, who's talking, uh, is, is, this, is one of our, this is one of our first challenges as a company. Um, because when we started our company, of course, we weren't integrated anywhere. So uh, we thought, oh, well, we, we have sort of the core technology. Let's, let's uh, get some recordings. Because you know, everyone's recording. Let's get some recordings. The problem is that the, the legacy telephony recording systems that are out there um, are terrible recordings. Because the first thing they do is they mix the channels together, and then they also compress them a lot, and so the audio quality is really bad, and it's and it's all mixed together. So then we said, well, if we want to use these recordings, there is a te there is a technology called diarization, which um, which if you know that there are multiple parties speaking, you can try to separate out who's who. But uh, that technology does not work nearly as well. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we made actually we made three separate efforts very early on in our company to see if we could do diarization, because we needed to get some audio data to work with. And, um, and it works great when people sound completely different. But you know, I've listened to recordings where I can't tell the difference sort of tonally between the, the caller and the agent. And then the other, the other problem with diarization is that is that, a lot, of, a lot of really important features are th that rapid, that timing between the back and forth. Like in a really good conversation, the timing between, you know, when, how people switch, uh, and switch and take the floor, is, it, it, it's, very, it, it's very fine timing. And you know, there, there's actually, typically the best conversations actually have a small amount of overlap. As soon as I start speaking, you stop speaking, I say what I want to say, and then we switch and, and like that. So, it, it, so it, it turns out it's really important to actually get cleanly separated audio. And, and the reality is that most telephony systems now are, are what's called VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol. It's packet, it's packet based, which means originally all the packets going in the two opposite directions are separate anyway. So to get them mixed, you have to do some work. Um, in, in the original analog telephony, it, it actually was not that way. It, it, it's you know both signals going back and forth on the same wire. But um, in modern telephony, it starts separated anyway. So now what we do is we're integrated to the telephony system, and we're getting the we're, we're getting the internet uh, the, the packets. So so when we get the audio that's streaming into our system is already separated uh, in the channels. Now there's still an issue because. Um, you know, a, a simple conversation is between two people, one person on each channel. But if you're in a, if you're in a telephone conference, now you've got multiple people on one channel and one person. But, you know, that's, that's sort of a second order, second order thing. I, I want to answer the second question, which was, uh, or the, your first question, which was, uh, oh, uh, where's the audio being processed? So uh, most of our system is, uh, is a SaaS, a software as a service, in the cloud. 
And so we're implemented in the cloud. We, we create a um, secure high bandwidth pipe between the customer's telephony data center and the cloud. Uh, uh, you know, we're in AWS. And, and, and so the audio is coming in there and then all the processing is going on on the, on the cloud. And then that gets back to the user through a, a, a web-based application. So the, the, the window on their screen is, is basically a, a, a small web app. Would you happen to have a marketing video or something that shows the product? Uh, we, we do. I think that there are some on our website. Um, I don't have one with me right now. Um, I, actually, I probably have one on my computer, but I don't know where, where it is. I haven't seen one. Two questions. One is, um, from the agent's point of view, do you take a standard uh, input from the agent just to see how they speak normally, and then compare that to when they're talking to the customer, or to the, to the yeah, I guess the customer, to the, to the company, and then do you constantly monitor that to see how it's changing? In other words, you're looking at the agent in real time and how they're conversing and seeing how that goes on and thus modify it the input that you give to that agent? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there are, there are certain cases where, uh, where we found we need to customize to the agent. I can tell you how we do that. Um, generally speaking, most of our models are, are, are universal. They're behavioral models. Um, the, the actual things that we're measuring don't change, uh, you, you know, regardless of the context or the language or the culture. Now, what meaning those things have does change, so there is a calibration on, on how we notify and, and, and things like that. So if you're listening to a Chinese conversation, um, you're going to have, you're gonna have sort of different, uh, a different back end to it all. Uh, but, but the front end, the, the part that's actually measuring uh, this, the behavior is, is common. Uh, but there are a couple of cases uh, that I mentioned where we found that the variation between individuals was enough that if we that if we just had a if we just had a standard model for that, then we were always bound to have some agents who were just constantly getting false positives. Um, so and that's a that's a bad user experience. So what we did uh, in those cases is uh, for the agents we have you know we have all of their all of their phone calls for you know the last six months or whatever. So what we do is we take a recent history and we do statistics on a recent history and we, we build a statistical model of their speech patterns and then every day that just gets updated to the, you know, to the, you know, whatever the time period is. Okay, the second question, and this is really changing something, maybe this is not what you're going to talk about or what you're going to say. How do you, what's the nuts and bolts of how this works? Do you look at frequency analysis? Do you look at amplitude analysis? How is it that you, that you have speech recognition in a sense here? Reading down to the nuts and bolts. Yeah, so uh, so the input is audio. Yeah. So audio, uh, so where we start is sort of the same place that, uh, that speech recognition starts, is we, is we have a very low level, moving window characterization of what's going on in the audio. So you know, we, use a, we use a 40 millisecond window that, that progresses in 16 millisecond uh, intervals, and so at the very lowest level, you know, we do a we do a frequency analysis at that level, and almost everything else comes off of that frequency analysis. So if we're looking at pitch or pitch variation, that that's going to come off the formants in the in the spectrogram uh, going forward. Uh, if we're doing, um, uh, we had a feature called dynamic variation, which sort of measures the variation dynamics. You know, that that you know has to do with the amplitude. Uh, we have sort of energy metrics and things like that. So all of that ultimately comes from, you know, audio is, is a time, it's a time right. signal and so that has a, a frequency content and, and that everything pretty much comes from there. Can you get right down to the phonemes? Well, uh, again, we don't, you know, we don't do, you know, our behavioral analysis is not based on words. So we're not looking at phonemes or things like that, but a lot of the, a lot of the same front end uh, we use, uh, you know, for those of you who are in speech, we use what are called MFCCs, male frequency capstone coefficients, um, and you know those are those are useful in in extracting phonemes. But you know we use them in a different way. We use them to sort of characterize the the 
the, the frequency spectrum. Uh, there's another question. Yeah, um, it seems to me that your pro your current product is helping the agent to handle customer services part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Or answering questions. Um, is there any plan down the down the road? Automatically, I mean, automate entire system. So basically, just handling customer service directly. Yeah. So there's a whole. Uh, there's a whole sort of segment of the industry uh, around what are called chatbots, which are designed to replace uh, uh, replace telephone call agents. But you also mentioned uh, something that I want to uh, comment on, which is uh, customer service. So, yeah, we're we're primarily in customer service, but really the technology that we've developed can be applicable to, to all kinds of conversations. So, uh, we actually are. We're, we're kind of segmenting our our market into, or not really our market, but our um, uh, you know sort of the the focus of the product in, into service uh, sales uh, sales conversations. Um, uh, there are there are uh, in insurance. There are claims conversations, and and there's also like like uh, care. There's technical support and things like that. So. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so that's one thing. Now, in terms of in terms of chatbots, uh, you know, we've been having this conversation for years. You know, people ask us, investors ask us, you know, oh, what? Aren't you worried that you know, with all this AI, that chatbots are going that are, are going to replace customer customer service representatives? So, th there's a couple of things going on. So, one is um, uh, one is what's called uh, uh, digitization or, or or whatever so you know this is a trend that's been going on for 10 years is that is that companies have been trying to to give their customers more self-service so there's simple things like checking a balance or or changing an address or something that you, you don't actually need to talk to a person to do that and in fact it's it's typically more efficient if they if you just give give them access to the database and they can just change it themselves right so there's web interfaces. There are uh, there are the the phone IVRs, interactive voice response. These robots, which are you know often uh, annoyingly used to uh, to try to prevent you from talking to a person, but um, but they can also be very helpful in in, ha in 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 letting you get some of these simple tasks done. So every one of our customers uh, has done all of those things, and and they continue to do all of those things, and their call volume continues to increase. Um, and what, what's more is that, what's more is that because all of the sort of simple transactional things are being taken, are being done, you know, automatically by self-service, the, the percentage of the calls that are just really tough, hard problems to solve has has increased. There's very few simple calls anymore, which makes the job of an agent even harder. <laughs> Because now you don't have a break. It used to be that every once in a while, the call would be, oh, someone just wants to change their address. Oh, I'll, you know, I'll spend a couple minutes doing this and sort of take a break, take a mental break. But um, that's becoming less and less possible now for these agents because uh, all that simple stuff's being offloaded to self-service. Um, the other thing is, if we go back to uh, what I was saying at the very beginning of the presentation, which is that we're dealing with companies uh, you know, these, with, with large call centers that have um, that have very commodity products, and there's very little differentiation. You probably don't care who owns your car insurance, right? You want the best rate, really, but beyond that, it doesn't matter. Um, and so, one of the one of the unintended side effects of of taking the personal element out and and diverting calls to self-service is it becomes a lot easier to change. There's no there's no emotional connection with the person you're talking to. There's um, if you can just say, oh, I'm fed up. I'm just going to go and then I'm going to digitally sign on to this other company and have their product. And none of these companies really want easy churn. They want the opportunity to keep your business. There's a there's a cost of acquiring customers, and 
there, you know, there's a benefit to, you know, to having long-term customers. So, um, so, you know, with all, so, so, so that's kind of on, on the business side of it. Like, it's not really a good idea for most of these companies. And, and, there, and a lot of these companies, our customers are now realizing and actually putting a focus. Like, um, I mean, if you've seen, I, I, think it, I think it was Amica, uh, you know, like Amica insurance companies like really put a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of their advertising into, you know, you're going to talk to a person and we're, you know, we're positioning ourselves as the best customer service. T-Mobile, I think has a as a campaign on right now is that the phone will always be picked up by a person. Now the, so, so I mean you can see it in the marketplace. These companies are all moving towards understanding that improving that human connection is really vital to their business, and um, and and actually if they and I haven't talked about technical feasibility yet, but if this were feasible to have these automatons talking. Uh, talking to your customers, it, it would just make it a lot easier for them to. So you're to trying to balance it. those two when you develop your software and your system. Right? Um, well, I, our customers are trying to balance okay. the, uh, you know, having good, uh, good personal conversations with self-service that, that they can offload. And I think that's good for customers too. Like there's certain things you just want to be able to do without having to to wait online and talk to a person and get them to do it. Um, so. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to underscore what you were saying about Amica because I do business with them and I have done business with Humana. Mm -hmm. And I do business with Blue Cross Blue Shield under a government sponsored program. Mm -hmm. Very large differences. With Amica, yes, you're right. They are emphasizing getting in touch with an actual agent, a human being, almost every time. And with me, the only reason I'm calling is I couldn't do it online. Yeah. Or with the bank by phone kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. The general observation about the customers who call in, there's a big difference between me calling a company with a technical problem and a couple of years ago, my mother calling up. Now, she didn't have the ability to get onto a web page or figure out all those things. So yeah. it seems that the system has to be able to differentiate somehow by user, which gets me really now to my basic question about analysis of users as opposed to analysis of agents. You said earlier... By users you mean callers. It callers. Yeah. Yeah, correct, callers. You said earlier that you don't do word analysis of what somebody says. So if I call up and say, this is the fourth time that I'm calling you, your system doesn't pick that up, is that correct? No, but uh, if we're integrated with the customer relationship management system, we already know it's the fourth time you're calling about the same issue because your case is still open. Okay, so, so the system can understand something about the customer, which yeah. is really where I'm leading. Yeah, it can. And Now, we haven't done much of this, but uh, so we know a lot about our agents because they're users of our software, and so we have all their calls and all their data. Um, now the, the the CRM, you know, knows everything about the customers. So we've been working with our clients to integrate with their CRMs and and working on what our product can do now that we we know both side, we know who's on both sides of the call, and and we can do some interesting things there. And then as we bring words into it, yeah, we can do a lot of those things as well. Is to automatically understand call context, like in terms of this is my fourth time calling or. Whether this is a um, whether it's a sales call or a or service call or things like that. So, without asking you for private stuff that you don't want to talk about, mm -hmm. where are you where do you think this is going over the next five years? Uh, uh, probably lots of different directions. So, <laughs> I, I, I guess did, did you have a? Are, are, well, are you asking wondering. like in terms it of automation versus the technology has moved a lot yeah. in the last five or ten years? Yeah. Computers are. Ten times faster than they were a few years ago. AI is getting better. People are understanding, learning protocols better, and I'm just wondering where 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 you think this business is is going. So what we're focused on is the the concept of being a being a coach, uh, augmented intelligence, and being being an AI coach, which is which is being able to understand 
how humans are behaving and help them perform better. And so that's our focus. Uh, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of directions that our product can go. We've talked about some of them here today. Uh, but in terms of, of being a better coach, I think that, you know, we, we have an ongoing we have an ongoing program that's you know improving our ability to uh, to understand and score conversations or parts of conversations uh, to understand different uh, different scenes in a conversation or different contexts of a conversation and so all of that will give us a bigger toolbox for being able to do a lot uh, a lot more things in our current sort of in our current business and I think where we want to where we want to extend our business is, is, as I mentioned before, is okay. You know, we're making, we're helping agents be better agents. Can we help supervisors be better supervisors? Can we help managers be better managers? Can we help uh, executives be better executives? And um, so, so that's kind of that's kind of our our, our vision and, and where and where we're thinking. Uh, but uh, you know, we still have a, a, a huge amount of work to do just just in the call center. Sir. Is this a, how does this work when someone buys this service? Is it, is it a plug and play program or is it a 10, 10 month process to get it implemented and they think? And what computer languages do you favor within your company? Okay, so there's, uh, uh, there's really only one complex part to getting our, our system up and running and that's the telephony integration. Everything else is a software as a service in the cloud. So, in that sense, you can just turn it on. The application's a web app. You just, you know, you know, get authenticated and point your browser to, to the thing. Um, but the telephony integration, you know, the telephony systems are are typically these lego legacy systems that are in giant data centers in in the the company. They have huge IT departments that run, you know, because obviously the tele the telephone systems are their the lifeblood of the call center. So. Um, there's a huge variation in these in these telephony systems. Even if you have the same system as someone else, the same physical hardware, the, the variations in how they can be configured in the different versions of the hardware, um, it's a uh, we have to go through a solution phase with the customer. And um, you know, some of our customers literally literally have taken 10 months uh, to you know from you know from you know contract to, to going live. That's not what we want. You know the. The, probably the fastest ones we've done have been a couple of months, uh, but there is a solution phase on that. Now that that's changing too, because now there's an emerging technology called cloud telephony, where the, the telephone you system is that word? cloud telephony. Cloud, cloud telephony. telephony. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you may have heard of a company called Twilio. You may have heard. Uh, so Amazon uh, Web Services has a service called Connect. Amazon of Connect. Uh, they have everything. So. Um, what, what you know, and there, there's actually dozens of uh, dozens of these companies, and and what they do is they actually put your telephony system in the cloud. So what they do is um, instead of the telephone company coming into, so I'm, if I'm if I'm a big, big company like Humana, instead of the telephony coming into my data center, and and then I have hardware which I bought from these telephony vendors where I'm doing all the networking and everything inside my company, um, a cloud telephony company. Is getting the uh, is interfacing with the telephone company directly, the public telephone network directly, and all all I'm doing uh, as Humana is I'm just signing up for the service and I'm pointing a web browser. Uh, actually, I, I think most of them have downloadable. So, so basically, you download uh, a desktop software and you have a soft phone on your computer, and so and and that's just connecting directly through the web to the, you know, all the networking that goes out into the public tel telephone system. So now I don't even have a telephony system on premise. Now the great thing about that is instead of us having to go and spend, you know, do a two month, you know, solutioning process to be able to interconnect our system with, with our customer's tel telephony system, there's just, a, there's just a, a, a cloud API that gives me access to the telephone system and I have my API for my, for my software as a service, and I just got to write a connector in the cloud. I, I, never have to touch the, uh, I never have to touch the customer's IT center at all. 
So that's really exciting, and that's something that's going to happen in the next five to ten years. I mean, it's already happening. Like, these companies already exist, and a lot of smaller companies already use cloud telephony because it's much cheaper to bring up than, than maintaining your own, uh, your own uh, telephony system. Uh, but uh, and, and adoption is starting to pick up in the, sort of the Fortune 100 sector of companies. And so I imagine in 10 years, there will be anywhere from you know, significant adoption to maybe entirely replacing uh, you know, legacy telephony systems. What, and what was the other half on the, the uh, programming languages your company favors? Uh, so on programming languages, it depends on what, what part. So the core computational system, because it has to be very fast, is written in C, C++. Uh, but that's, that's, you know, that's that core, but then, then we have web services, and those tend to be written in Java. And then, uh, you know, the, the front end, the web application, uses, uh, you know, modern, modern web application technology, which is JavaScript and React as a framework. And um, what else? Uh, there's a lot of aspects of, of connecting cloud components that, uh, that relies on Python. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what's called serverless technology, but uh, instead of, so in, in, with cloud technology, there's basically three ways to deploy systems. The, so the, the oldest is you simply have a, a, a server. You have a virtual machine or a server in the cloud, and then you just you load all your software on that, and you, you basically are running a, a server that someone else is, is maintaining. Um, more, more recently, uh, there's been a, uh, technology called containers, which is basically uh, a software sandbox that that sort of that sort of virtually represents a machine, um, but you don't have your own server. These containers are just being run on these container farms, and so it's much it's much easier just to deploy that because you can test it internally and then you can just throw it out into the cloud and it'll just run. Um, but then then there are uh, then the, the more modern uh, version of the cloud. Uh, there's a deployment methodology called serverless, where, where you don't really have any concept of a server at all. You're just running a function, right? So a lot of, a lot of data uh, transformations are run using, uh, using this technology, where there's some event that just triggers a function, and, and the function may be written in Python or something, but what that's going to do is it's going to like go over to one database, grab some data, process it, put it in another database. And so what you can do is you can just write these functions and you can put them in a, in a sort of a function repository and then some resource, out, some computational resource out there is going to pick up the trigger, go grab the code, run it, and then put the code away. Um, so uh, why did I get into server? Oh, because we were talking about languages. So, so they, they, typically, they typically allow you to write functions in maybe half a dozen languages. And the most Common ones of those are, are Java and Python, but you can also, um, I think you can also write them and write those functions in JavaScript and a couple of other uh, languages. Two uh, questions about reliability. If you do go over to the cloud telephony and these cloud-based uh, centralized databases, uh, first on the databases, are they HIPAA compliant? Absolutely. So again, we we deal with. Uh, some of the biggest companies in the world with some of the most sensitive data in the world, insurance companies, banks, and healthcare institutions. And so uh, a big challenge for our company, especially over the last 10 years, um, you know, these are all regulated industries for one thing, so, uh, and we're getting more regulations. So uh, many of you might have heard of GDPR. Uh, it's the European Privacy uh, uh, Regulations, which went into effect, I believe, last year. And, and now there's the CCPA, which is, which is basically GDPR for California, which is eventually, which is eventually going to be, um, I mean, we, ba we basically need to comply with that, so yeah. that's basically going to become a national thing if here. If one too. state requires it, you're going to roll it out nationally because you're yeah. mostly national companies. Yep. Yeah. And international companies. So right. everybody does things according to GDPR, even if it's not required. Yeah, so GDPR is a privacy standard. Um, there are also security standards. We have a whole security department which is based uh, uh, on making sure that we, uh, uh, we get through certain uh, security certifications. So uh, yeah. 
you know, we, we have a certification called High Trust, which encompasses HIPAA and other things. And we have certification around PCI, which is the uh, sort of the credit card information, uh, private credit information. Um, and that's required in the, in the financial industries. And uh, we, have, uh, we have what's called SOC compliance, which is a sort of op operational procedural compliance around uh, how we run our internal processes you know, to make sure that we don't make mistakes and things like that. Now, so. uh, there was also a secondary thing about reliability. You've gone over the security and the privacy very nicely. Yeah. But if I'm a call center mm -hmm. and I'm using cloud telephony, what happens if my connection to the cloud goes down? Where's the fallback? Redundancy, you mean? Yeah. A redundant uh, contact. Now, that was well, that's your contract with AWS. Switch if you have multiple <coughs> redundancies with AWS, you'll never, you'll never fail. The, the, call, the, the, the failover will be invisible with AWS. Okay. If, if your connection to Cloud A, if you will, breaks, yeah. Cloud B picks it up seamlessly. Theoretically. Yeah, of well, course. Well, actually, at, at that point, yeah. AWS is going to start falling yeah, apart. Yeah. So you have a bigger problem. Basically, it's already paid for, too, in yeah. terms of uh, you know, how many stations and how I mean, much you, you infrastructure think, you you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, but that's uh, my understanding. No, I, absolutely. It depends on how catastrophic the failure is. Yeah. Like, it, it, you know, if, uh, if, if U.S. East goes down, it'll be picked up by U.S. West. But if both of those go down, <coughs> like there's a nuclear <coughs> explosion and the whole world blows up, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, there have been some recent headlines about stuff. But it, like that. AWS gives you option if you if if you want to have just east and west separation, you pay one price for AWS. If you want to have global separation, then you pay another price for AWS, and they put servers almost on every continent and every 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 hemisphere, so that you know, barring the worldwide collapse of the of the internet, you're going to have a server somewhere that's going to handle your transactions. Yeah, if you're paying the top tier price. That's right. So but that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's solved by money. Many consumer-oriented call centers, I may be wrong about this, tend to go low if they can. Uh, well, it depends. I mean, we're talking about Fortune 100 yeah. companies. They, they can't afford 50,000 agents to go offline. So yeah. there's, there's different regions in the world. There's different availability zones. And there's, uh, you, you can design your systems to fail over. Uh, so all, all this is what Amazon's business is about, AWS business. So it's about. just as costly, God forbid, if uh, it's like the airline the computer failure, it's just as expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if AWS goes down, we're, the world's in big trouble. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they've had some outages, but not complete failure. <laughs> okay. So I, I was seeing here, it's kind of an analogy between agents and callers and teachers and students. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I was wondering if there's a prospect of using this kind of stuff. I mean, there, you can imagine different contexts, online tutorials or online courses or even in classrooms. Yeah, I think that's, a, real, a, that's a really good example of, of where you can apply a coach yeah. uh, in teachers in the classroom. In fact, I think at one point, we, uh, I could be wrong, but I think we were talking to the Gates Foundation about a project that we, and this was early on in our company, of, of possibly doing uh, you know, some kind of, of teacher training Mm -hmm. classroom training mm -hmm. yeah. type of thing and I, I still I think that's a great application um, the uh, you know I, I don't know that we're going to get to that anytime soon but um, but that is a that's, that's a great application because the roles are similar right yeah although the lack of the telephony yeah so th that is a big issue there, there are there are a lot of applications where there are conversations that we would like to be able to help with but one of the great things about a telephony-based application is that you have close mic uh, con conversations and that they're separated, right? So one of the applications that we were working on for some time was, um, was uh, intelligence interviews. So uh, you have two people sitting across a table and, um, and uh, you know, uh, we, uh, you sort of want to analyze the conversation, see if you can pick up signals of, of dishonesty or, or things like that. Um, but you know, aside from that whole application area, the you know one of the technical difficulties is how do you get how do you get speaker separated data in sort of an ambient environment? It's pretty hard. You know, we set up directional mics and, and you know tried to get separation that way, um, but it, it was it, it was pretty difficult. It's pretty difficult to do it. So. So any any kind of application where you're um, 
you know, where you're dealing with, uh, you know, trying to get conversations out of the air as opposed to off the wire are, are going to be a little bit more difficult, uh, just from an audio point of view. <coughs> but, you know, who knows, with, you know, with machine learning, you know, we, we might be able to get better and better at, at, at being able to, uh, you know, differentiate who's talking. I mean, we can certainly do it ourselves. And um, so the signal's, the signal's obviously there. Uh, the, uh, but, you know, having, can, can having you a imagine moment. miking everybody? Uh, you, you could in certain cooperative environments, but like uh, if you, um, I mean, like, like think of a classroom. I mean, yeah. very. I mean, you might be able to, but, but it's kind of awkward. And uh, if you're talking about um, having a, I don't know, like in an interview situation, you know, that, you know, do you mind putting on this mic? You know, <laughs> like in, a, in a school of education where you're actually trying to teach. People. Oh yeah, yeah. In a, in a training situation, yeah, in a training situation, I think I think it can be done. And in fact, I think there's a lot of good training applications for this kind of technology. Who does the best job of differentiating off the air speech among multiple users? Oh, I, I don't know if, uh, yeah. I, you know, like I said, we, we, tried, we tried a number of times ourselves internally to build diarization technology. Everyone claims. Uh, what is this uh, word? It's called diarization, what, what it means is if you have a stream of audio trying to identify different speakers, like who's speaking when. Mm -hmm. That's basically what diarization is. Um, you know, so, so many, so many co companies claim that they have, you know, world class, ninety percent or you know, ninety nine percent, you know, accurate diarization mm -hmm. But it, it, in my experience, it hasn't been, uh, and I haven't looked into it in a while, so I, I don't know if I can answer your question. But, um, but I, I've, I've been disappointed with it. And and the other thing that I mentioned is for our purposes, it. it, it Unless you, unless you can accurately get get the overlap part, you know. So in, instead of making a forced choice as A speaking or as B speaking, if you can identify very accurately uh, in time um, whether A and B are both speaking at the same time, unless uh, until you can get to that point, uh, diarization is not going to be great for some of the you know some of the dynamic features that we're looking for. Um, so for the time being, um, it, it's great to have you know these isolated channels uh, that we can do this off of because we can we can do some really cool things with it. So there's a bunch of biometric data that's available to help classify the caller, things like their age, their their sex, and, and even their medical ailments. There's application where you can tell somebody has pneumonia, for example, interacting with a nurse. Some of these specialized um, verticals that are out there that are can getting traction so that they can go through the next level in a specialized domain? Uh, th there are some. Um, uh, so we did some internal projects about five, six years ago on, uh, on gender identification, which was very successful. Uh, that, that's, that's actually a fairly easy problem to solve. Uh, we also tried age. That was not so easy. Um, so I think that that's pretty unreliable. And, and Probably you can imagine why. Like, it's sometimes really difficult to tell. There are a lot of uh, applications of very similar uh, voice analysis for various diseases. So I know it's been applied to Parkinson's. Uh, we we had been talking to uh, people about, and, and 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 I don't know I don't know so much about speech, but there's certainly a lot of technology aimed towards autism, and. Uh, you know, actually, I, I kind of glossed over this completely. We haven't been talking about the company's history, but our company actually started in in trying to identify clinical depression, and uh, and we did a big DARPA product uh, project um, early on in our company, where we were focused on, um, on on trying to to solve some of the problems of, re of retur returning war fighters, uh, you know, with PTSD. Uh, depression and suicidality. So, you know, we in our own history, and in fact, we we spun off, we spun off part of our company last year, which was sort of the remnant of that DARPA program, uh, looking at uh, at distress like uh, depression and PTSD, uh, into a company called Companion MX, 
and that is a technology that looks at behavior on your mobile phone. Not necessarily the conversations, although there is a conversational component or a voice diary component to it, but just your daily activity and, uh, and, and tries to understand uh, if you're in a clinical setting, like you've been diagnosed with some sort of episodic uh, mental illness, whether, um, uh, whether you're going off the rails. Uh, and and an, interesting, uh, an interesting thing in our, in our company history is that the clinical trial for that technology was done here in Boston in the first half of 2013. And if you remember, right in the middle in April 2013 was the Boston Marathon bombing. So we had a cohort in that study which was uh, diagnosed with PTSD and, uh, and then a healthy control group. And we, we got a very good model from that data uh, because there was coincidentally a traumatic event sort of right in the middle of that clinical study. And so that, that's one of, uh, you know, but and then the data we intended to collect, <laughs> we, we have as well, and that led to a sort of a clinical model for monitoring uh, uh, depression in, in patients. It's 11.30 now, and I, I'm afraid this is the kind of a conversation that could go on for three more hours. But I really want to thank you very much for doing a really interesting